The power of the web has revolutionized the way that we connect and share experiences. Film, television, and, well, teaching have all been transformed by the ability of the web to transmit video. One way to put video content on a web page is to use the video element in HTML. Just like the audio element, we can create a video element with both an opening and a closing tag. We use the source attribute to point to a video file, and we add the controls attribute to tell the browser to create a video player for us. Great, we're done now, right? Well, there are a couple problems for us to solve. The first has to do with how videos are encoded. For the simplest version of this demo, I've made a video file that is 480p, compressed using the H.264 codec delivered as an MP4 file. 480p means that there are 480 lines of resolution, or 720 pixels wide by 400 pixels tall. It's standard def, not HD, not 4K. I'm using the H.264 codec because it has the widest support across browsers at the moment. Much like choosing between PNG, JPEG, GIF, or SVG for images, there are a bunch of different codecs which a video file might be encoded. Video files contain a lot of data and can get incredibly big when they aren't compressed, far too big to travel across the internet. So any internet video is using a pretty hefty mechanism for smashing all the data into the smallest possible package. There have been many attempts to make the ultimate codec, real video, Sorensen, Windows Media, Flash, H.263. There have been a lot of codecs. From about 2015 to 2020, the H.264 codec is the one that's dominated. It's the codec that most of us are using most of the time. But the thing is, it's not open source. It's patented. It's owned by a consortium that charges fees for every device, every operating system, every browser, every camera, anything that wants to be able to record, compress, or play H.264 files and they are about to charge way more for H.265. None of the underlying technology on the web should be patented. HTML isn't patented. You don't have to pay to use CSS. Why should video codecs be different? To fix this, a lot of effort has gone into creating a truly open, not patented, but still super awesome video codec. Folks had hoped that WebM would emerge the winner, but it's still unclear if it will. More recently, there's great hope that we've finally solved this with AV1. It's looking like AV1 is a better codec than H.264 and is truly royalty-free. Time will tell on how things shake out. The good thing is that the video element has the ability for us to point to multiple source files. We can use more than one codec at the same time. We can use H.264 and WebN, and once there are tools for making AV1 files, we can use AV1. This works the same way as it does for the audio and picture elements. We use a source element to list multiple file formats with the source attribute to link to the file and the type attribute to tell the browser which type of file it is. The browser will play the first file that it understands. Which brings us to the second problem to solve. I've got a 480p file here. What about the people who have a faster connection and want HD or 4K? We'd like to send them a pretty big file. We have a solution for this with images, with the image source set and picture. But there's nothing in HTML that will allow us to send different sizes of video under different network conditions. In part, that's because we don't want a device to get only one moment to make a choice between, say, standard def and high def. We want it to make that choice over and over and over again. Maybe someone has an HD screen, but the network is kind of slow. So instead of sending them a 1080p file, we want to send them a 720 video. But then as soon as their network speed improves, we want to switch from 720 to 1080. This is how Netflix, Hulu, HBO, YouTube, Vimeo, and all those TV apps work. They're constantly switching from one resolution to another as people watch using a technique called adaptive bitrate streaming. The whole thing is really complicated, and basically it requires a Shermer farm of transcoding robots. Which is why, when you go to put video on a website, 
it's likely you might not use the video element. There's a good chance you'll use embed code from a video hosting service, which I'll talk about right after we talk about captions. It's pretty amazing that we can put audio and video on a website, but not everyone can always hear or understand the audio. Some people are completely deaf. Other people can hear sometimes certain things in certain conditions, but not all the time. And for people who can hear, well, they can't always listen. Sometimes people would listen to a video, but there's some place where they can't use speakers and they don't have headphones. Or they are listening, but they can't really understand the people who are talking because of an unfamiliar accent. Or maybe the person who's talking is talking way too fast. On the web, we have the power that we need to provide content in multiple ways simultaneously. So let's add captions and make our video more accessible to everyone. To do this, we'll use the track element and point to a text file. The video player will provide all the functionality so a viewer can turn captioning on and off or switch from one set of subtitles to another. There are many file formats for captions, but on the web, we want to use WebVTT, Web Video Text Tracks. It's basically a plain text file with a VTT extension that uses a certain convention for providing the information. You can see here each line of text with the timecode information that tells the video player when to show each line. To get these captions to show up on our video, we put a track element inside the video element. Just like the sources element, it's part of a list of options for the browser to use while rendering the video player. On the track element, we'll use the source attribute to point to the file itself. We'll use the kind attribute to tell the browser that this is captions. We'll add a label of English that will show up in the player as a label for this choice. We'll use a source lang attribute to specify which language this is. And we'll put a default attribute on this track element to specify that this track is the one we want to use by default when a user turns on captions. We can see now that a little captioning icon has appeared. And when we click on it, we have options for off, auto, and English. The word English shows up because that's what I put in my label. Now I'll add a translation into Spanish and offer some options for subtitles. I've got another VTT file, this time in Spanish. And we'll add another track element inside this same video element. This time we'll set kind to subtitles, set source lang to ES for Espanol, and create a label of Espanol. Now we can see that there's a second choice in the list of subtitles, and we have Spanish subtitles. There are a few other options for the kind attribute. We could create a VTT file that has descriptive information about what's happening visually in the video and use kind equals descriptions. This gives people the option of playing a track that reads aloud descriptions of what you'll miss if you aren't looking at the video. For instance, the astronaut jumps off the ladder and bounces a bit as he hits the ground. This makes a video more accessible to the blind and the visually impaired. Kind equals chapters gives us a way to provide a text file that lists the chapters in the video, giving users a way to jump from one section in a video to another. Captions and subtitles are powerful, and in many places, they're actually required by law. By providing them, you'll make it far easier for more people to find, watch, or listen to your content. Add captions, and your traffic will go up. Embedding is taking content from one site and placing it into the middle of a page on another site. It's common to embed something complex from a service that takes care of all the hard parts for you. So what HTML do we need to know to help us do this? Well, basically you get the HTML from the service that you are using. Let's use YouTube as an example. Here's a YouTube video that I made, and let's say I want to post it on my own website so people can find it on my domain name and not have to go to the YouTube website. I'll look for a share button or some other clue about where I can find the embed code. Here it is, share. I see where it says embed, and let me click that. And I see some options, privacy enhanced, that sounds good. I'll click copy and I'll get some code copied to my clipboard. I'll paste this into my HTML, and voila, now I have a video embedded on the page. We don't really need to understand what all of this says. The engineers at YouTube wrote it all for us. 
Although, now that we know how to read HTML, we can see a lot here that we recognize. The iframe element has several attributes on it, including height and width. We could adjust those. Source is going to point to the source of the video file. Iframes are powerful. There are definitely some security considerations to be had about pulling in code from other sites like this. So if you're using a CMS that someone else set up, like it's your job to post content on a WordPress website or a Drupal website, there's a good chance that you can't just paste some random embed code from another website into your system. There's a good chance that the CMS is set up with a different way to allow a URL or a short code from a specifically white labeled source. And you'll want to talk to someone who knows how to use your CMS to find out how to embed things like YouTube videos. If you're the person building a site, you probably want to think about how security will work when it comes to the iframe element. If a bunch of different people are going to be entering content into a system, you're not going to want to just allow all iframes. Think about the security. If it's just you posting your own videos on your own website, then it will be fine.